Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to today's Smart Bear webinar session on API standardization. With the holidays coming up, uh, we're trying something a little different today than our usual live webinars. Um, we're publishing this webinar in full, so you can watch it at your convenience. Uh, that means no calendar invites or waiting, just the full video. Um, so you can watch it and share it with your team um, whenever it makes the most sense. Uh, so if you have any questions at any point about Swagger Hub or API standardization as we're going through this presentation, um, you have a few different options. You can click the chat bot in the bottom right hand corner at any point, and we'll try to provide an answer live if we're available. Um, if you have multiple questions or want to have a longer discussion about the tool, you can click below to schedule a demo session with one of our engineers. And lastly, if you want to see how the tool works firsthand, you can click below to create a free Swagger Hub account and get in and see the tool right away. Um, so now that we've got that housekeeping out of the way, let's make some quick introductions. I am Patrick Londa. I'm a marketing manager here at SmartBear, and I work on uh, Swagger Hub and our virtualization tools. And I'm joined today by Jonathan Fortunati, who is a manager on our solutions engineering team. Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining. All right. So today we'll be discussing achieving API standardization with Swagger Hub. Um, so it's a big topic. Uh, first, let's just take a quick snapshot of what we're going to cover today. Um, so we'll introduce SmartBear briefly for those who aren't familiar, and then we'll get into why standardization is so critical to your API practice. Then uh, we'll highlight how Swagger Hub can help your team create a single source of truth and begin the process of standardizing on the open API specification, uh, formerly referred to as the Swagger specification. All right, so let's uh, jump into it then. So uh, for those of you who are wondering, uh, who is SmartBear? Uh, we're the company behind over a dozen leading software quality tools, spanning the full software development lifecycle. Um, so many people know us for open source tools like Swagger, um, SOAP UI, Cucumber. Um, so we've been recognized by Gartner as a leader in test uh, software test automation software. Uh, and we currently have roughly 7 million users of our tools worldwide. Um, so if you're facing a software quality challenge, we probably have a tool that can help your team out. So here's a, a quick snapshot of our product portfolio. So you can see from left to right across the software development lifecycle, uh, we have code and document review tools like Collaborator, Swagger Hub for design and documentation of your APIs, which we're going to cover today. Um, also, we have tools like HipTest if you're trying to take a BDD approach. Um, Service V Pro if you're trying to virtualize services, reduce dependencies in your development. Um, and then a lot of testing tools, cross-browser testing if you want to test on real devices and, and different browser types. Zephyr if you're doing test management. SOAP UI Pro if you're trying to do uh, API functional testing. And uh, Load Ninja if you're trying to do UI testing. Alert Site if you're trying to monitor. So we have a whole bunch of different tools. Um, we have free trials available on smartbear.com. So feel free to check out any of these tools listed here. Um, so that's just a quick plug. But again, if, if your team has quality challenges around your testing or your design or your development, um, chances are SmartBear has a tool that can help out. So today we're going to be talking about API design primarily, um, but we're going to be talking about API quality more broadly. So let's start with a big picture look at why standardization is something that your team should be invested in. So in this section, we'll be referencing our 2019 State of API report, which we released earlier this year. And for this report, we surveyed over 3,000 software professionals about their API design, development, and testing. So we tried to get a really comprehensive look at uh, Teams API practice across industries, across company sizes. Um, so we'll be referencing that in this section. And one of the top findings that we had was that API quality is king. Um, so we asked respondents about their expectations as, as consumers of APIs. And in 2019, consumers expect efficient, high-performing services that are easy to use. For many businesses, their APIs are products. So just as companies have to consider user experience when designing a product, API providers need to consider the developer experience now. Um, and that experience means that the API needs to be high-performing 
very usable and well documented. Uh, on the other side of the equation, API developers recognize these expectations from consumers and 42% say that quality is extremely important. Um, and basically 80% of folks say that uh, quality is important or extremely important to their organization. So consumers and providers are on the same page. Um, if a provider is offering a poor quality API, it translates to lost customers and can actually result in damage to their organization's reputation, um, which you can see in that chart on the, on the bottom right there. Um, so some of the other costs that respondents selected were uh, loss of time and resources dedicated to testing and fixing a subpar API um, and decreased speed in being able to actually deliver on projects. So what does quality really mean? Um, so, so far we've mentioned some characteristics, you know, high performing, easy to use, well documented. Um, but when it comes to the reality of it, how does your team actually track quality? So quality is really determined relative to standards. Um, so setting standards and enforcing them allows your team to maintain consistency across your APIs. And if your APIs are not in compliance with a specification or they're all documented differently and interact differently, it can create a bad experience for the consumers you're hoping will adopt your service. Um, so when we ask respondents what API technology problem they hope to be solved in the future, standardization was their top response, which we found really interesting. Um, and then followed by that was versioning. Which, which really does make sense because um, versioning is also a really important consideration. If your organization doesn't have a single source of truth to identify the current versions of your APIs, you could end up wasting time working on an outdated version or have teams that aren't aligned on exactly what the current version of your API actually is. And as teams evolve and as APIs evolve, it's becoming more and more important to be able to quickly inform your consumers of changes that could impact their work. Um, so versioning, especially as, as teams start to support multiple APIs, um, versioning is critical as a consideration there as well. And how are, how are most teams attempting standardization today? Well, uh, for the most part, teams are conducting manual reviews, um, checking against internal style guides to keep their APIs consistent. Um, over 50% of respondents told us that API style guides are important or very important for their teams. Um, so most of the standardization that's happening today is it's very manual. It requires a peer review and it, it, it relies on these internal style guides being ad adhered to. So if API quality is going to be a priority for your team, that pretty easily translates to API design being a top priority because the earlier on in the software development lifecycle that you're able to ensure quality, it's more cost effective and it means that you're going to have fewer problems later on when it comes to testing and monitoring your APIs. So what's, what's a way to really build in that quality early on? There's a few different steps that you can take, but first off, it's gonna to wanna to start with defining a workflow that makes sense for your team, expediting your process with automated validation, designing and cataloging pre-approved assets, and then um, staging, virtualizing, and testing. Um, so all, all, all of these are bullet points that we're gonna get into and, and um, walk through a little bit, but this is just kind of the outline of as your team is, is starting to look at your API design process, are these boxes that, that you currently have checked or that um, you're moving towards in the short term? Because again, uh, there are existing solutions for these things, but they don't have a great fit um, in that they're easily embedded into a workflow. Um, you can build out an internal style guide to reference. That might be a wiki page or a PDF but that is relying on, on the folks on your team checking that style guide, making sure that that's the most up-to-date version, um, and then in manual reviews, looking and, and double-checking that that style guide is being adhered to. Um, there are linters that you could use, uh, custom sort of in-house style validators that you could build. Those are sort of ad hoc solutions. They're not exactly tailored to what your team is trying to go do. Um, and if you're building anything in house, that's going to come with maintenance. So there are costs to that over time as well. And then there's that peer review, um, which is how most teams are, are keeping their APIs standardized today. But again, that's, that's bringing in a colleague to check and make sure that, um, everything lines up from a style perspective. And, and that's not really an efficient use of time. 
Um, but you can't only go with linters or, or uh, style validators because then you won't have the, the peer review, which is also really important, where you get someone to look at the context of what you're building um, and share best practices as, as part of that review. So the ideal approach there is automation for style checks, but also a peer review process. So you can do that knowledge sharing and you, and you can check for those contextual issues. So that brings us to Swagger Hub. Swagger Hub is a platform that ties together all the open source Swagger tools in one place. Um, so you might be familiar with them, you, you might not be, but these are open source tools like Swagger UI, Swagger Editor, and Swagger Code Gen. Um, these are all sort of individual tools that have been developed to help folks move their APIs towards the Swagger specification or the open API specification um, and be able to generate interactive documentation and uh, SDKs as a result of that. Um, and an editor, if you're, if you're working on YAML files. Um, so all of, these, all of these open source tools we've bundled up as part of Swagger Hub. SmartBear is the company behind the open source tools, but for folks that need more of an enterprise offering or, or something that uh, enables collaboration and it can really be baked into your entire workflow, um, Swagger Hub basically allows you to create that single source of truth for your APIs. Um, and as part of that, there's a lot of uh, sort of structure and guidance that you can build in as you're trying to move towards API standardization. Um, so you can set up different teams in your organization uh, different style guide checks uh, to make sure that you're standardizing your APIs, and then domains, which are reusable assets. So rather than uh, talking about Swagger Hub, we figured we'd, we'd just jump right into it and show it. Um, so I'm going to hand it off to John, who's going to walk through uh, some, of the, some of the use cases in Swagger Hub that will allow your team to start standardizing your APIs around the Swagger and Open API specifications. And I'll stop sharing my screen so John can take over. All right. So we'll cover four things here. First, we'll look at establishing a single source of truth and how Swagger Hub can help us there. Then we'll look at setting standards. So how do we use those style guides? Then we'll talk a bit about collaboration, how to get feedback on our API definitions if we're taking a design first approach. And then we'll look at creating reusable assets Again, part of the standardization umbrella um, through domains. Before we go look at those things, I'll give a brief overview of what the platform looks like because we'll be bouncing around between a few different screens and I want everybody to be comfortable with what these screens are. So the first screen we'll be looking at today is the home screen. This is where we're going to go to see a list of our APIs. It's the first thing we see when we log into Swagger Hub. The next most important screen, they're all equally important, but we'll be looking at is the editor itself. This is where we see the definition in YAML and where we can do things like leave comments. And again, we'll come back to this. Um, and then the last screen we want to look at is our admin screen. In here, this is where we can manage admin level settings about our organization. So let's go back to talking about uh, the first topic, which is establishing a single source of truth using Swagger Hub. And here, that's where we're primarily going to stay in the home screen um, because this is where our list of definitions is stored. So Swagger Hub acts as our central repository where all the definitions of all the APIs within our organization live. And whether it's for developers internal to our organization or our consumers external to the organization, people can use Swagger Hub to come to this catalog and find the API definition that they're interested in interfacing with. And there's a few different ways we can find that API. Now, obviously, the most uh, straightforward brute force approach would be to look at this large list and scroll around until we find the definition we're interested in. Now, for me, where I have maybe a handful of definitions, that's not too hard. But for teams that have hundreds or thousands, that can be a little difficult. And that's where the first discovery feature comes in, which is the search bar. Nothing groundbreaking here, but something very helpful to help us look for these definitions. There's also some ability to filter and sort these definitions based on attributes associated with them. But really when it comes to discovery, uh, it comes to the organization, how you organize these API definitions. Um, and that brings us over here to the left sidebar where we have appropriately named our organizations. And our organizations within Swagger Hub are um, 
the highest bucket that we can group things into. Team members can be members of an organization and through organizations we can assign roles. We'll look at that in just a second. And under organizations, we can also assign projects. So you can see this folder structure here. These are the different projects. And again, we can associate people and definitions with projects, which helps us on one hand, maintain access controls and things like that, but also from a discovery point of view. If I'm looking, for example, to find some calculator API definitions, I can just go to the calculator project. It makes managing this large catalog a lot easier. And let's go into our admin screen now to take a look at how we can set up this organization. Here's where we can choose the different members of our organization. And again, there's a few different roles here. Some people will be consumers. These are the people who are just interested in finding our definitions and then just referencing the documentation so they can start to interface with them. Then we have our designers. And these are going to be people who are actually building out the definitions. They're making changes to the YAML file and updating the definition. And then finally, we have our owners. And these are going to be people who are just, um, they're admin-like managers of the organization itself, adding new members, maybe deleting definitions, um, working within the organization as well. The other thing we can do here is build out teams. So we can create different teams and we can group people into these teams. And then we can use these teams to make it easy to share definitions. So if we go back to our projects, we can associate a team with a project. And then that means everybody who's on that team can now see all of the API definitions associated with that project, at least be able to see view only access to those definitions. Last thing we'll talk about here is if we go into a definition itself and look at the editor, when it comes to discovery, as Patrick said, an important piece of that is understanding what version of the API you're working with. And we can see here that we're able to give different versions to these definitions and we can tag these versions as published or private. And this is important because we can show to our internal developers that if something is published, it's in a finalized state, it's read only. If something is public, that means anybody who can get access to the Swagger Hub instance. If it's SaaS, that means anybody with a Google versus if it's on-prem, that means you'd have to have access to your network. But if anybody uh, can get access to it, they can see that API versus private, which means you have to be given explicit access to the definition. And if you make an API private, the nice thing about that is not only can you control access, but you can control how people access it. So if you look at our sharing options, we can see that we can give people the ability to edit, comment, or just view the definition. And we can do the same with teams. Again, leveraging those to make it easier to share and view these definitions. All right, so now that we've looked at establishing Swagger Hub as a single source of truth, let's look at setting standards. So we're going to go back to our definition or our organization's admin area, and we're going to look at the standardization section. So this is where as an organization owner, I can come in and set guidelines that all of the APIs in my, all API definitions in my organization must abide by. I can make these firm guidelines by requiring all of my definitions to abide by these rules, or I can make them soft guidelines by just flagging violations, but not necessarily requiring the violations to be, um, to be fixed, to be rectified. And where these rules come from, these are based on best practices about what makes an API more consumable. A really great obvious example would be if you don't have a description. I don't know how to use this operation. And that's something that would make it hard for me to figure out how to use this definition. So if I'm selling my API as a service, that means people will be less likely to use my API versus a competitor's. We want to make these definitions as easy to use and understand as possible. Also for internal APIs, right? Making it easy to interface with the APIs that your team is building means you have less questions from other teams asking you how to build out this API, which means you have more time to focus on development. And now if we look at what the application of these rules looks like, let's head back to the editor. We can see at the bottom of the editor, we have this red bar that's telling the F31 standardization failures. So in the background, Swagger Hub is linting this definition and telling me when I'm violating one of these rules. And we can see some of the rules down here alerting me. So I don't have to do a manual inspection of the definition, I can have this automated and done for me, and then I can simply fix the rules. 
All right, now that we looked at standardization, let's look at the process of collaboration and getting feedback from all of our stakeholders. And for this, we're going to stay right in the editor. Now, just to recap, we've talked a bit about sharing and collaboration. We've talked about how I can make my API private and I can send out and invite people to work on my API and give them different ways of accessing this particular definition. Some people may edit, some people comment, and others just view. If you look back at the definition itself, this is where people can come in and using the editor, change parts of the YAML definition here, add new servers, write out new descriptions, endpoints, things like that. And we can also leave comments on the definition. And we can resolve these comments to keep track of something if an action item has actually been taken. This is going to allow us to give different stakeholders the ability to look at this definition, say, yes, this is what I expect, and then go build it. That makes sure that we're building the right thing. When the API definition is done, when people have agreed that, yep, this is the thing that we want to build, uh, especially again, if you're taking a design first approach, that's when we publish our definition. And now we'd start building from that point forward. And this brings us to something that's related to collaboration which is interfacing with other tools, especially a tool like Git or a um, API gateway. So for each version of my API, I can connect that to a different Git or API gateway. We have a number of different um, built-in integrations here. This is going to let me share my definition out to a wider audience, especially with automated processes that we have, like a build tool, um, again, a Git, repository that's going to help us put Swagger Hub into our workflow. And we also have a generic webhook integration that we can use if we wanted to uh, send information to something that we don't have a built-in integration for. And just to give people a quick idea of some of the ways you can export things from Swagger Hub, Swagger Hub does have code gen built into it so we can create different skeleton code from the API definition itself. You can also download the API itself and also the um, HTML for the documentation. So it makes it really easy if you want to incorporate Swagger Hub into a CI CD pipeline or uh, if you want to alert consumers on, on certain changes that are going to occur. Um, Swagger Hub fits in very nicely there. And one more piece related to collaboration is um, the end documentation. I'm sure everybody here is probably familiar with the um, Swagger style documentation, what that looks like, but I wanna stop there because one thing that Swagger Hub does uh, that I think is really helpful and that a lot of our customers find very helpful is backs documentation with a mock server. So part of collaboration means understanding what does it, what, what does it feel like to work with this definition? How, what does it feel like to get um, data back from this API? The mocking server is going to help us do that. So if we look at an endpoint here, I can click try it out. And now normally I'd have to have try it out and I'd have to have my documentation pointing to a real server that's actually serving my API if I wanted to get data back when I click this execute button. But the mocking server means I don't have to do that. It's going to give me examples of what a response looks like. And now I can see the data form here without actually having to build anything. So again, from a collaboration point of view, if I'm a developer, I can now get a quick idea of what this definition will look like or what this API will look like once it's built. And I can do that very easily. All right, last thing we'll talk about is creating reusable assets through domains. And I have a little demonstration here that I'll pull up. So this particular API that I've built out has a few different versions. We're looking at version one. And if we look at the YAML defined for version one, we have a 200 response code here. Now let's pretend that there's nine other APIs in my organization and all 10 of these APIs are going to use the same 200 response. Now, right now that would mean I'd have to go in and write out that 200 response every single time, 10 different times. However, if I use domains, domains are a reusable asset that lives at the organization level and can be reused by all the different definitions, all the different APIs within my organization so that I don't have to rewrite these things and also so I can have some control around what a 200 response looks like. So if we look at the latest version of my API, in this definition, we're referencing the domain. So we can see my 200 response and we can see my domain here. Again, this means that I can build this once and then anybody else can use it. 
I can put some control around who can change this if we go back to those collaboration and sharing options. And if I update this, now all my definitions are updated. So it makes the maintenance of the definitions a lot easier and helps scale my API development practice. Especially if you're really building out a lot of APIs, being able to just reference these domains means that you're able to create those APIs and design those APIs a lot faster. Um, and then, yeah, John, as you were saying, on the maintenance side of things, if you only need to update one domain and that spreads out across your APIs, um, that's, that's a huge time saver and also reduces the risk that you have um, as an organization providing your, your services. All right, well, thank you, John, for covering all that. Um, so just as a, as a quick recap, uh, in this session, we talked about why standardization is so important um, and referenced a lot of our findings in our 2019 State of API report. Um, additionally, we talked about how you can use Swagger Hub to establish a single source of truth for the REST APIs in your organization. Um, on top of that, we talked about standardization, collaboration, um, and then being able to start to reuse assets so you don't have to start from scratch every time. You're able to break up your API design and development into assets that you can continually use and monitor over the long term of your API practice. Um, so again, thank you everyone for, for, for watching this session. Um, again, if you have any questions, uh, please feel free to reach out to us, uh, whether that's by email, uh, chatbot, uh, scheduling a demo with us, or, or getting right into the app. We do have uh, a support chat in app. So if you want to create a free account and you have questions, um, just hit the, the little chat button and we'll be more than happy to uh, reply and, and try to answer those questions for you. Um, so again, thank you and have a wonderful day. Take care.